seem like uh, we have give amount of time enough for everyone to come in if someone is gonna be coming in me, uh, is it forecast on social media facebook and no it's just gonna be here and youtube uh youtube okay yeah i'm gonna go in the air or live in you on youtube okay i think i should check it check it on youtube and share it yeah I will check it on YouTube. I don't know. Can you share the link kindly on the? You mean uh, which link? For the Wait, YouTube, the for live. YouTube. Sure. Please, thank you. I think the other light washed me off. It's not for Zoom. like to give a quick shout out to Mr. Eugene Edgerson. Uh, thank you, brother, for joining us today. Good evening. Hello. Hey, brother Jerome. Hey. How's How it doing? going today, brother? Doing all right. Running a little late. I know uh, just trying to get ready. I've been cleaning all day. Just took a, came out of the shower. So. Oh, I know how that go, man. I, I did mine a little bit earlier this week, so yeah. I can be a little bit more relaxed during the weekend. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I've been cleaning all day, actually. Yeah, that's what's all up. Night today. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are you still waiting for people? Yeah, we are having people starting to log in right now. Brother Yahani, uh, he's getting things fine-tuned there at the studio. Yeah, I'm trying to get on the YouTube, actually. Just give me a second. Okay, thank you, brothers and sisters, for joining us today. I'm Brother Eugene Talford, and welcome to the new Africa Network. Uh, broadcast and uh, we'll be with everyone shortly. We're getting everything fine-tuned and uh, uh, just be patient while we get things uh, with the guests coming in. Thank you. Greetings, Sister Mary Apollo. Uh, welcome to the New Net, uh, New Africa Network. Uh, I've heard a lot about you. Uh, we'll be getting the show uh, pretty soon here. We're just getting a few things fine-tuned. And uh, welcome to the program. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for New Africa Network, Brother Yohani and Hana Igoni, everyone who, who is joining us today to listen to the topic of the African continental free trade area and we can discuss more and get different opinions of how to improve it, how to, to move with it to benefit the women of the continent. So I'm excited. 
All right. Yeah, we are on uh, on YouTube. We are live. So let me send you the let me send you the link. Just good. Okay. All right. Sorry for that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming today. Today we are on the first, possibly this is the first time we talk about African continental free trade where we're still also waiting for the lady from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, uh, uh, Miss uh, Lakma Mwita. Uh, I, I'm trying to get in touch with, him, uh, with her, but I haven't. So I'm still trying to get in touch with her. And uh, and uh, I am also uh, pleased to have uh, our sister uh, Mary uh, to our panel discussion. Uh, we had a few uh, difficult weeks. Uh, two, the last two weeks we were very, very, uh, we had a lot of going on with uh, Ethiopia and the current situation in Ethiopia. But today we're gonna be talking about the economy. Uh, which actually play a lot of in whatever is going on in Africa. So thank you so much for everyone to tune in. Uh, let me give microphone to our, our special guest who is here with us to introduce herself. Then we will go uh, forward. By the way, um, this this panel discussion it is not financial or is not supported by any political party or anyone except for five of us, which is uh, me and uh, brother Eugene. Uh, sister uh, Katare uh, and uh, uh, brother, uh, brother, brother Matthias Jerome and Russ. Uh, so yeah, those are the people who are who are supporting or who has put this, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to work. Again, thank you so much and uh, welcome to our special guest, uh, Mary. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, can, can you give us a little bit of your background? <clears throat> okay. Uh, my name is Mary Apollo. I'm, uh, I'm originally from uh, South Sudan, the new youngest uh, country in Africa. Uh, we get our independence in 2011, and I have been a journalist for uh, over nine years since I graduated. I, I, so I grew up in Khartoum, Sudan. I was born and raised up there. I uh, went to get my education there. And then up to the independent, uh, after I graduated, I decided to become a journalist. Then I get a journalism training and I start reporting. And I report about the South Sudanese referendum. And at that time, I also did a lot of civic activism work. Uh, that working with my local community in, in Sudan and women in general. And then, yeah, and then I moved to the South Sudan when we become independent country. I continue doing my work in journalism. I have done a lot of activism work. Then I came to the United States in 2016 uh, to, do a, uh, to do a fellowship by the State Department that bringing leaders from 75 countries uh, from around the globe. I did a lot of uh, mo mobilization work uh, with youth and people who are in the, uh, globally in the African community and globally and some work for the South Sudanese refugees and about their uh, education and their issues. And then and I also got a chance to travel to different states and I'm a member of PADIA, the Pan-African Diaspora Youth Association, that was created by Ambassador Ekana uh, to work with African youth uh, in, the, in, in the United States, people who are in the diaspora, to help them be part of the African development, like the diaspora movement youth who will build the continent. Yeah, and then I did, uh, I, was a, 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 I was a vice chair for a health sector but I was also doing a lot of mobilization work and activism work to encourage uh, younger people, youth, to come to Pan-Africanism leadership, uh, build their, their capacity building. Yeah, so I get an award for that in 2019 by the International Human Rights Commission Fund and Trust. They have selected the 
the best hundred uh, peop, uh, youth lead, uh, the best hundred leader advocate around the globe. So this is me. My background um, mostly was journalism, and then did shift to activism also. And I do writing. I, I, I'm a writer. That's very good. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming in. I see you have very good background uh, uh, on uh, special uh, the new country which we're going to be talking about today. Uh, now, tell us a little bit about uh, your experience in Africa, especially uh, before independence of South Sudan and after independence of South Sudan. Okay, uh, actually, um, I'm one of the generation in Sudan. I was born in Khartoum, Sudan, when we were one country, uh, and I didn't get the experience of uh, traveling or living in, in, in this house. Uh, all my life I spent in, in Sudan, the Northern Sudan. And I didn't get to move a lot uh, because of my dad's uh, career and he was in the military. So we moved a lot from a state to another. And I get to meet different people, get to have different experience uh, from different backgrounds uh, that build up my personality to become who I am. Uh, so growing up in, in the North, and then there was a conflict going in the South, uh, we have been, I have been uh, actually discriminated uh, for a lot of reason, a lot of, uh, there was a lot of uh, political uh, movement going uh, against the, the South Sudanese, South Sudanese, at that time, uh, some of it like we don't have uh, the access uh, to resources, access uh, to education, uh, a lot of the laws that were, were against the South, against us, we were discriminated uh, to where we belong to. There was a lot of uh, some cultural, traditional and practices that was not respected uh, by the government and even the, the, like there were some laws and legislation that were against us and, and they were using to oppress us as uh, a South Sudanese citizen, a South Sudanese because they forced the Sharia law in 1989. When they come to the power, they forced the Sharia law. So uh, it was not a good thing to do because they were oppressing the other people who have different background, different culture. For example, if you are from the South and you have different religion, you practice uh, Christianity, for example, and or the other African uh, beliefs, you have different cultural practices that you should uh, practice yourself, but that was not allowed to you on that system. You have, they will just judge you when you go to court and there was a lot of things, for example, like we have a lot of women who were marginalized, who are in the, uh, who from the, our local community, who live in the areas of Sudan, Khartoum. Yes. Uh, they have been doing a lot of, uh, uh, they would just call it illegal, like uh, trade to, to make income uh, for their families and for their life. And a lot of those women, like they were being, uh, Cashed by the police uh, to be to be in the court because they were not they were doing some uh, work or illegal. For example, selling the the food on the street, uh, selling the selling the drink, alcohol, selling tea. You know, all those people were were exposed by the power, and that's why there were a lot of women from South Sudan region at that time who were in prison. And I get a chance to meet them and talk to them at that time. And this is where my activism, like, uh, sense grow from. I find that, like, they talk to me about their experience and what they have been going through. And I know that it was not right for, for the government to force only one identity. So I start working with it. And it was a good experience. And then when we became a different country, we, I also moved to the South. And because we have been that, that region who have been in, for, for, uh, in a war for 21 years, and there was a lot of work that I supposed to do there. Uh, and I know that I have to do it. There is capacity building, uh, engaging women and young, uh, young people to the civic activism and a lot of 
uh, media campaign awareness that that's supposed to be done. So this is yes. back to your the question. Do you think that uh, 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 South Sudan uh, to be separated from Sudan it was good? Uh, based, uh, according to what you are saying, but let me take a little bit back. When uh, um, they apply a Sharia law, which is uh, uh, definitely a law of um, those who do not know, is is very much like Muslim uh, mm -hmm. the government structure uh, applies in government, but also applies in religion. It's used in uh, in uh, in many places. By the way, Sharia uh, in Swahili means the law. Oh, okay. Yeah, so Sharia would be the lawmaker or something like that. Yeah, so uh, what did the other uh, Sudanese uh, say when, when the, the Sharia was applied to the whole country? Regardless, this, this part the, the South Sudan, especially, they are, there is a lot of num big number of Christians, uh, and also there is some people who do not even believe in God as, as well. So what did the other part of Sudan, especially North now, what is Sudan today? What did they do or what did they say? Uh, actually, it was a, it was a historical uh, problem and it starts earlier. But the thing is that the government was using the Sharia law and the, and the Islamic law uh, to, to market their political agenda. So they were just using it uh, to be able to mobilize the simple citizens to convince them that the, we are applying Islamic State, we are using the Islamic, we are protecting Islam from everyone. And this is what, this was not true because the government has other agenda that they were doing actually. Uh, at that time, they, they announced the jihad for, for, for the South Sudan. They, they start collecting like younger people from Sudan. They said, okay, we're going to fight the people who are in, in the South and kill them to protect Islam. And that's when they start, like some youth who went from there, they start going voluntary to join the government and to go and kill people in the South. And this was not the government agenda. The government agenda that the, that time they were fighting to use the oil and the resources that South Sudan have. But the concept that they went to the people, they tell them that we are protecting Islam, we wanna fight them. So they were using the Sharia and the Islam only to to protect their image uh, globally and, 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 and within the Sudanese citizen themselves. So at that time, there was a lot of Sudanese also who were disappointed because we have people in the West, people in the East, people also in the North who were marginalized. And there was no, uh, there were no development first of all, of all those regions. Even the North where the government uh, came from, like the central government, they were not developing the, the region where they, they, are, they belong to. So all the development was just in the center where, where the government is, where the uh, decision making is, uh, where the parliament is. And they were only using these resources to mobilize themselves and to benefit the people who were in the power. That is why uh, it became harder. And there is other places like the Nuba Mountain, the Blue Nile, the West, they have been also, the government used the same strategy also to marginalize them and let them be in conflict and they were using their resources to develop the center. So that's why uh, the, the peop, there were a lot of people who were asking for, to move the, the development from the, uh, from the central to the, to the, to the people to, who are, uh, in the rural area. So yeah, so people were just, at that time they were feeling disappointed and, and they were asking for change. Uh, they asked that uh, this, uh, this has to change, this scenario has to change and they are aware that the government is not doing the right things and they have to respect each, the, the other citizens, they have to move these services to the, to the rural area and some of them, they were uh, the Sudan People Liberation Movement that was created by Dr. Garang, who were fighting for over- You mean John Garang? John Garang. Okay. But he, there was a war for 21 years and he was fighting for South Sudanese to get 
uh, what he asked for, he said, no, we don't want the Sharia law to be forced for everyone. We want a Sudan where everyone, just as a human being, as a Sudanese, to have our own beliefs, uh, our own religious, what we believe in, and we just do it. We don't need the, we don't, we don't need to be in a law. We don't need the government to force it for us. We we'll just yeah. let everyone be the way they want to be, and they, they want they have to be all first class citizens. Yeah, I, I know some of our, 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 our listeners or our audience, they are asking what this has to do with uh, African uh, uh, continental free trade. But let me be honest to you. There is the whole purpose of uh, African continental free trade is uh, to kind of dismantle the borders between each other, each country. That's whole, the whole reason why we are doing the uh, African uh, continental free trade is because the movements of people in Africa, it is very, very difficult and it's very, very worse. And the reason it's difficult is because the borders made by countries. So the starting by the creation of South Sudan, uh, which until today, me personally, the reason why I was asking those questions is because I don't believe and I'm not convinced that uh, South Sudan should have existed. I believe that uh, the problem that was in Sudan and South Sudan, uh, the issue people were facing, it was possibly a little different, but all Sudanese uh, in South and North, they both has problems uh, of bad leadership. Yeah. So I believe that uh, both they should have worked together to actually free each other instead of uh, getting South Sudan independence or separated. Uh, because if you look what is going on now, uh, South Sudan is not really in good shape. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, can you tell us about that too? Yeah, actually. Uh, one moment, one moment, sister, thank you. This is brother Ras Alula on the line here. And uh, I co-host with brother Yohani and brother Eugene and um, Brother Jerome, Sister Katari here. So I would just like to know um, what is, what is the, the uh, religious ratio between the Christians and the Muslims in, in Sudan and South Sudan? I would like to know that um, because you mentioned um, Sharia law, and you know, there's, there's. I, I believe there's more to the Sharia law than than what was mentioned here. Um, I do know that there is a Christian population in Sudan and in South Sudan, mm -hmm. um, in particular. And so, when we talk about Sharia law and we talk about Christian populations, it's more than just you know what what was stated earlier. I believe you know because. Uh, there is a spiritual war going on around the world and where Christian populations are. And in most countries that uh, implement Sharia law, which is very extreme, um, is very detrimental to the Christian populations. So if you could tell me what is the population between the Christians and the, and the Muslims in both countries, that would help out a little bit. And also um, it may bring a little understanding as to why there needed to be a South Sudan. Thank you. Yeah, actually, uh, in the old Sudan, they were Christian, they were Muslims uh, also. Of people who are from North, West, East, uh, all these uh, areas, they have Muslim population. And, but the problem that the integration between the citizens themselves who are coming from different uh, religious backgrounds uh, at that time, at our generation, was not that good because the government was selling and representing the idea of those people are our enemy, uh, those people are just doing other things to, to, to damage the Islam picture, you know? Uh, to not, don't, not let us live in peace. Like they were selling this email, image politically, that's why there was a lot of people who are like handling themselves back from, from integrating from uh, with other Christian. 
But at the same time, there were some people who were like culturally uh, engaged with other people and also they have kind of friendship and lifestyle. It depends on, even the institution actually play a role on that. Uh, our educational curriculum play, play a role on that. And uh, the institutions uh, themselves are like, they were forcing that because uh, I was lucky, I went to a school, a, a Catholic school where they, they teach us to respect both of, uh, of, of religious background. We used to have a class that, uh, we, in our religious class, we have, we get, uh, we se they separate us for two. The Christians go together in one class and the Muslims go together uh, in, different, in different classes. But for, take for example, in the government uh, uh, schools, only Muslims have the right to study Islamic religion in the school. But but they don't give us the but they don't give the Christians the religious curriculum in the school because they were not con it was not considered as something is for important. If you want it, you can go and take it in your church uh, outside the school, or you try to find your way, and then they can mark you, and then the the church will send your result to the uh, to the to the to the school so that you will be evaluated. So. In education system and in cultural system, like in the general places, uh, we some we are not allowed to go without uh, covering our head or wearing a veil, you know, and all these uh, all these practices have just doesn't. It was not a good way to for us to integrate uh, with, with with each other in the community. Right, so it sounds like you're saying that the dominant religion is Islam. That's what it sounds like you're saying. Yeah, it um, was Islam because the government have the authority to use it and to force it for everyone. That's why. So the government is Islamic. Right, yeah. so yeah, so I'd still like to know the population difference between Christians and Islam, like back to the question. And also, um, as I was saying, where Islam dominates the government whether it be Sharia law or not, usually is detrimental or very difficult for Christian populations in those societies. And that's what it sounds like you're saying as far as education is concerned and far as, as far as um, freedoms, um, freedom of expression. You mm -hmm. say uh, head covers are, were mandatory or something like that. And that, you know, so yeah, if you could just tell me the population and, Okay, uh, is South Sudan mostly Christian? Yeah, yeah, actually, South Sudan mostly Christian. Oh, but okay. South, at least we don't have that issue of uh, religious because we live in, you know, in, within the one household, you find someone, the mother is Christian, the dad is Muslim, and some of the kids go with the dad, and some of them belong to the mother. But we don't have that, that kind of a religious complication. You know what it sounds right. like, Let Brother me, Raj? Go ahead. Brother Raj, uh, it kind of sounds like uh, uh, some colonized minds uh, that all of us Africans have had to endure. And from them, it sounds like Islam uh, in that part of Africa was used to help enslave uh, us both mentally as, as well as physically. Uh, and then using the religion itself to divide uh, black people from being Pan-African, I believe that is a tactic that has been used by our colonize, uh, uh, black colonizers, uh, uh, African colonizers for many centuries. So I understand that there's a divide uh, with the Sharia law, but I believe too that there are uh, religious fanatics all over the world uh, both Christian as well as Islamic, and sometimes uh, could go a little bit overboard, and but also having to understand that uh, as we are uniting as a Pan-African movement, uh, those are some of the institutions that have been used to divide us as people uh, to being able to uh, collectively come together as a unit, uh -huh. uh, as African people. So can you elaborate on What's the uh, Pan-African atmosphere for brothers and sisters on both sides, both in the South and the North? The I mean, problem yeah. with that, 
the, in the in the you know in the south in Sudan in the north, the government was trying to sell the idea that they are Islamic Arabic. They are refusing that they belong that they are Africans at all. Uh, hold on and, for a second. Hold on. Do you guys know that I'm making a video of uh, seven countries where people deny to be Africans or to be black, yeah. and the first one is actually the Sudan is the first yeah, one. Yeah. So they yes. were denying that they they don't have any origin to to deal with Africans. They were they were part of the 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 Afri the, the sorry the Islamic Arabian like they joined the the Arabian um, Association, and they were refusing the fact that they are African. That's why the most of the people who are coming from the African descent were oppressed and they were marginalized and they will see them as second and third class citizen. Even the practices that they were forcing people to do, like uh, people are not allowed, uh, allowed to drink alcohol, people are not uh, allowed to go with menagerie, cut, uh, cover yourself, like, you know, to do all this uh, Arab Islamic practices. But this is why there was a conflict between the South and the, and the North for that long time. But the idea of the Pan-Africanism actually was, sold in in the in the south this political movement that the there was a, a a movement called the uh anf the african uh national front uh in the south at that time and they when they raised their voice and they asked people that sudan belonged to the africans and we are working on that and then literally they came with the sudan people liberation movement also they were selling the idea of pan-africanism like we are we are pan african we are africans and we are trying to be part of the the african continent so so both of the country they have different uh, you know skills. yeah let, let's shift let's go back to our free trade uh special with women because the history of sudan and south sudan uh is very very uh is long time history but uh, one thing i want to highlight for brother uh ross uh, North Sudan, uh, or uh, yeah, or you maybe can now you can call Sudan, is majority dominated by Muslim, uh, who does not even believe that they are African, as I was showing on 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 screen. Uh, mm -hmm. The president Al Bashir, Omar Al Bashir, whom uh, was president possibly maybe the past thirty years, he changed the national language from I don't know what was, but he made but everyone to he made everyone to speak Arabic and he introduced the Sharia law uh, to everyone. Sharia law is very, very a mess. Uh, regardless, even if there is Christians or not, even in the Middle East, it requires so many things uh, that are outside, are out of concept, especially when it comes to freedom. But, you know, the problem that they change the education system to Islamic, even the curriculum were included Islamic verses, uh, everything, like Arabic, everything. And then the problem that the majority of the people who are in power, their kids don't study these uh, curriculums, you know? They take their kids uh, to international schools where they can learn other languages, where they can have different curriculum that is more uh, popular in the, in the work market, in the job market. Yes. So, All right. uh, so hold on, Johanny. Yes. Uh, and then we can go back to the free trade, right? Women and free trade in that movement. Um, so, you know, you questioned the, you know, you questioned the idea of uh, South Sudan. It says, you know, as if you disagree with it. And for everything that I've just heard, it sounds like a perfect reason to have a South Sudan. Uh, number one, the South Sudanese are black, African, Nubian, um, Christian. Um, Whereas the North are black, denying their black African selves, um, aligning themselves with the Islamists, the, the Muslims, and directly Saudi Arabia. And they were uh, oppressing the, the South. They were oppressing the blacks. So, you know, from what I've heard, you know, those reasons alone, it, having a South Sudan to those in South Sudan seems very much necessary and i'd like to you know close you on that yeah okay yeah let me let me give <laughs> yeah. you a little little uh, little little kind of details about it and and i don't know if you know what is going on or what has been going on in south sudan since when they get independence they've been killing each other two two tribes 
Anwera and Dinka. Uh, 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 by the way, <laughs> I'm an expert on when it comes to Africa. <laughs> so I do believe that uh, looking very, very quickly, it was a good idea for uh, South Sudan uh, to be independent, okay? Uh, there is, there was a lot of reasons, there was a lot of uh, uh, why, uh, there was a lot of, a lot of op uh, uh, oppression from uh, uh, people from, uh, uh, from uh, North, uh, those who denies to be uh, even Muslim or being African, I mean. Uh, but however, uh, the same situation also applied to uh, some other North Sudanese. Uh, as she just mentioned, that uh, some in North Sudan, they were, uh, they, the kids were not, uh, the rich people were not taking the same curriculum as it was. So we, in other words, uh, the fight should not have been uh, to separate from, from South Sudan and North Sudan. The fight should have been how to construct or to change those things together because more, once the people are divided, mm -hmm. It's so difficult to put them back together again. So it, that is going to be even more difficult. If we talk about uniting Africa now, it's going to be so difficult to bring Sudan and South Sudanese together. It's just going to be a, the most of difficult, like Eritrea and Ethiopia. Because but they were already together, brother, and they were going through so many things right now as together. You know, yeah. uh, everyone has the right, you know, to their own sovereignty. And if those rights are being denied, and they're not getting it, then they have to go and get it, number one. Number two, you mentioned the blacks killing blacks or the South Sudanese killing South Sudanese. Um, of course, that will be difficult. You know, forming a new country is always difficult and there's going to be um, heartache and pain throughout the journey, you know, but we have to be confident that they will get it together, number two. And number three, we can't leave out the fact that you know we know the vast resources contained down in juba down in south sudan very a lot of good resources are contained there and we know the same powers that be that were oppressing them in the first place the same arabians who were causing disruption in the first place you know among other things among other outside forces who don't want to see black nations succeed are still working to make sure that that young nation doesn't succeed. So, and that's, how, yeah, and, that's how, and that's pretty much how the Arab nations are surviving. They're surviving off of the economics of black people, black power everywhere on the earth. It's the same as the Europeans survive off of the west coast of Africa. The Arabs are surviving off the east coast of Africa, them and the Chinese and, and whoever else. Right. So, yeah, so what we want to know is what can we do to help promote Pan-Africanism, uh, the divide that's between the North and the South, whether you're Christian or, Mo or Muslim. Uh, can you tell us what the Afro does? Oh, sorry. I think there's many people who are speaking. Yeah, so, Dr. Okay. Kani, you want to continue off what you were saying? I think also we have a conflict uh, that's going now uh, recently. It started in 2013 when these two leaders who are in power, they start killing each other. And then they, they have went to peace agreement twice and the peace agreement collapsed. Uh, right now they just went again for, they, they, start, uh, they have signed another peace agreement and there is still tension in the government and I don't think it's going to last for long because uh, the leadership itself has a problem and they are the one who are misleading people and guiding people in, in different places. Uh, so I think it's the best way for us to sell the idea of Pan-Africanism in that context that this is the solution for us and this is the thing that is going to help us to come together because uh, currently is always everywhere in Sudan or in South Sudan, the, the, the people the, in the power and the people who are in the decision making and the one who are benefiting and the, the citizens themselves are suffering. Uh, they, they, they don't get any benefit of it and we're just divided and they're suffering. There is, uh, there is famine going on. There is a economic inflammation. There is a, uh, people, you know, 
people are as refugees, we have 1.4 million refugees who are outside the country up to 2020 today. It's just, it's not stable. So if we are selling the idea of Pan-Africanism, that is, that's the only solution that is going to bring us together to build our economy, to, to have that stable space where we can accept each other and where we see each other in the leadership and use that opportunity also to reach to the African, uh, we have the policy to reach to the African uh, regional uh, countries so that we can develop the country and develop the region. Because in Sudan, they were selling the idea of uh, Islamic, uh, Arab Islamic, and most of the, the deals and, and, and you know the political activities were done, they were doing it not with the African continent, it was majority with the Islamic, uh, the Middle East African community, because this is what they want to do, like the, the trade agreement, uh, even the, you know, the different, the, the movement of the people were toward that, that region, because this is, this is what the government want, this is, what, this is how they see Sudan. Okay, yeah, let's go back to the real topic. Now, uh, the, the African continental free trade is a uh, idea was born, uh, possibly was pushed by the president of Rwanda most of the time, and it was signed, I believe, in 2019, which is, uh, is kind of taking almost the tariff down from uh, the trade between uh, the countries. Uh, and... Uh, I think that uh, the 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 whole uh, the whole idea is because a lot of products uh, are coming from outside of Africa. Even the products that can be founded in Africa, for instance, we have people who are uh, importing uh, chicken. You know, mm-hmm. is that importing or exporting? Whatever, which one it is. But uh, yeah, chicken from America to Africa, uh, rice. Uh, from China, uh, but uh, while we we are in Africa, actually we produce our rice, we produce rara uh, rara chicken as well. Or another good example in uh, in Nigeria, in North Nigeria, there is a country called Benin. Uh, Benin, uh, if you want to buy cement, you go to get cement from France. But there is a cement right in, in the south, which is Nigeria. There is a cement industry that produces uh, uh, cement. So uh, how do you see this? Uh, Barry, you're mixing two things up about Nigeria. There's a Republic of Benin, and there's a city in Nigeria called Benin. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was meaning Benin as a country. Benin, yeah. Yeah. It's so, colonized by France. Yes, it's Benin. Yes, so the Benin as a country, they they ship, they get a cement from mm. France. Is they, and again, look where France is from from Nigeria and Benin, ben, uh, and compared to uh, getting cement from uh, from Nigeria, next country. So, how do you think this is gonna work? Because we already kind of uh, 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 how do you call it? We are addicted to. Uh, buying things from outside. How do you think this is going to work? Yeah, I don't think this is going to work. And but but it has been. This is what have been sell for us from from the, our colonizer and then the people who have been in the power and the continent for a long time. Uh, it's not a it's not a good thing, and we need to change the mentality of our thinking that everything we are producing is the best for us to, to use. Uh, for example, from instead of going and buying the product from all the way from France, and we have the reliable resources, and we have an issue of an employment. If you take, for example, in Africa, there is uh, three million only jobs for, for use. That's only on the, on the government sector. We have those people, we have to employ them, and we have the resources. We have, uh, we have to use what we have locally to be able to build our infrastructure and sustain ourselves. And from there, we can do trade uh, with, within the, our, the country in the neighborhood, and we can export also to the outside instead of depending uh, 
from the outside. We have to change uh, our mentality of thinking and we have to design a new plan where, where we can benefit out of it. I think that will start with we having the leadership who have the good visions for that. Tell us a little bit about uh, some of the resources uh, that South Sudan, South Sudan have uh, as a nation and uh, what are the manufacturing sectors look like both in all sectors, including uh, specifically in the agricultural sector? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that industry? I think when it comes to South Sudan, we are a rich, we are a rich country. Uh, uh, Sudan and Australia, um, there's another country, we they used to be considered the, the country that will be the breadbasket of the world in the future. In South Sudan, we have the oil production that mostly the country is depending 98% from the oil revenue only come from the oil production. And right now with the COVID, it went to 95%. There is minerals, uh, copper, gold, silver. Uh, the, our agriculture, there is agriculture uh, because uh, South Sudan is on the the Savannah region, industry, like uh, the problem is that what is happening in South Sudan, the government is only depending in one sector, only the oil, and they are forgetting about the other sectors, including the agriculture. The agriculture only have 1% of investment, and we are exporting everything from Uganda, the tomato, the fish that come to us from Brazil, you know? Even the chicken, we get it from outside. The rice, the tomato, the onions. Uh, there is a time that the, there was a problem in the border between uh, Uganda. The, the bridge was broke between Uganda and Sudan, uh, South Sudan. And there was no product in the market because we couldn't get it from Uganda, you know? And that was difficult. And we already have, uh, we have that, we have this, um, this land, we can use it to be able to sustain ourselves in the agriculture system. Uh, and, who, and who are the major trading partners with uh, South Sudan? I know you guys are sort of landlocked, and uh, we know that Uganda, Rwanda, and Kenya are the closest neighbors. Uh, how's the trade relationship uh, with those nations uh, since the uh, uh, reconstruction? Uh, yeah, it's going well actually between, uh, I, I can say that it's uh, Uganda, Rwanda, Kenya, as you mentioned, and Sudan as well. Uh, this is the countries that we, in, in the East Africa region, that we are open to get trade on it. On it. Also, there is some countries uh, like Somalia, they also were there. Who Don't are, forget uh, Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Uh, because Ethiopia, Somalia, they were also there. Uh, each country has their uh, their own manufacturer and they, their own uh, products that they are working on, on under the ground. Like for example, the Somalian are working in the oil industry. Most of the battery station uh, are owned by them. They are the one who are working in the oil market. The Ethiopians, they are having some of their trades in the market. The Kenyans, the Ugandan. So this is most of the countries that are, are working there. But the problem that uh, uh, I don't see the government, uh, the country itself have that uh, great income or um, they're getting more benefit from the ex exporting the, the product from outside. Even, even the, if you take, for example, the taxes, there is no, highly taxes for, for, for the people who are bringing go goods to the, to the country. But what needs to be done that the, we need to come with a vision where we use all the reliable resources that we have in the country. We have to work in agriculture. We have to work in the mining. Uh, we don't have an electricity, by the way. We, we, we are working, we're using the generator and solar system until today. And we are just close to the river Nile. So, even the water, there is no cleaning, uh, clean water, drinking water for, for the population in the city. We buy the water, as are you buy the, we buy the drinking water, we, we, uh, the, the sustaining water that we use in the house. 
you know? Well, it seems like uh, since the major sources, petro uh, refining, uh, oil, I, I believe also Sudan produces a large amount of uh, liquid, liquid natural gas as well, uh, yeah. produce liquefied natural gas as well. Uh, and it, it sounds like to me that most of the income is going out, resources and income is going out, but getting very little back. And it's maybe that the commodity itself uh, could be underpriced, uh, or perhaps it seemed like there could be some type of uh, skimming off the top of uh, the resources to get back to the grassroot level of uh, helping to develop the nation itself. Yeah, that's right, actually, because the, the percentage of, uh, of the oil uh, itself uh, supposed to every place that ha producing an oil they're supposed to have percentage like 20 20 percent of the income that should go to the to the to, to build the infrastructure that th these places need like the services of health schools uh, you know uh, good services but the problem that this money we don't know where it's going so it's going to specific individual people who are in the power like who are using that uh, that uh, that money to and also sudan has a uh strong relationship with uh uh the world bank united nations who have been uh supporting the country itself since independence so uh maybe it could be that the country itself has a large amount of debt based on what took place with the prior war between the North and the South and sort of been uh, being penalized to pay back some of what been put out from, uh, I guess, support mechanisms, uh, institutions that had supported the country's independence. But yeah, we would definitely like to uh, get our brothers and sisters connected mm -hmm. with what we're doing in the Afro diaspora to help create uh, manufacturing and job opportunities I don't know if you are aware of uh, Sister Hurricane Churimbero Kwa, who is the former ambassador of the African Union, yeah. but she's a very powerful sister that have been pushing the jumpstart of the African Industrial Revolution, uh, which has to do with uh, a united Pan-African economic concept to bring forth uh, opportunity that otherwise didn't exist because of the neo-colonial powers uh, that were weren't once in charge. Uh, so uh, tell us a little bit about uh, women uh, on the ground. What are some of the women doing now uh, as opposed to COVID to help suffice income at this moment or generate income at so this moment? Let me go back uh, to the point that you mentioned about the, uh, the oil revenue. I still, still think that there is a lot of, uh, of amount of money that can be used to to build the infrastructure and to the benefit of the people and people should receive the good uh, services from, from that income. Uh, but, but this money, the, we don't, the citizens themselves, they don't see it. As up to today, the South Sudan didn't pay the fees for the East African community. The membership fee, they have 60, billion, 60 million they're supposed to pay, like they haven't paid that, that yet. Just an issue that there is a mismanagement of, of uh, of resources, the mismanagement of a leadership that has a vision that can move uh, the country forward. So uh, some organizations like the World Bank and the UN, uh, they are working uh, with the government directly and they have projects under the ground. But sometimes it's just hard to discuss that with themselves. Doing right now with the COVID, as we know, women have been a responder in the front line uh, in the COVID-19 in Africa, worldwide in general, in Africa and in South Sudan, for example. Uh, they were working in the healthcare places, uh, in the community, based community themselves, in the as a civic civic activism uh, work. They have been doing a lot of, of, of work of uh, mobilizations to the, the community themselves, and they are facing a lot of challenges. There is a lack of resources, a lack of information, as we know, a lack of training, uh, but, but they are still trying. 
uh, those women uh, groups, they were still trying to move uh, from different places so, so that they can be able uh, to teach people about the COVID-19 so that they will be able to, to rescue the, those who, who are in need of health assistance. Uh, as we know, in general, there is, there is no access to clean water. There is no access uh, to some of the, the medical challenges that they have. They don't have masks. Some of the places that don't have uh, enough ventilators, uh, some access to hygiene and clean water, also uh, access to sanitary pads, um, and take up to in addition to that the the lack of poverty and the lack access to information that are handling them. But they are still uh, a great fighter in the front line, and they are trying to make a change in these communities. In the continent yeah i think let me go back to the point you made between the uh, the trade between uh, uh between uh south sudan and the neighbors countries uh, which this actual will read to me i know today we're not talking about ethiopia but i'm gonna a little uh, put this in there uh you can uh, live from here juba uh hold on i thought i i shared this with the screen sorry sorry uh, here we go. Uh, you can live here in Juba, as you guys you can see, with bus, whole way to Bujumbura, whole way to Kinshasa, somewhere in the Congo at the end here, uh, Kinshasa here. Uh, you can live with the bus from Juba, whole way to Nairobi, Kenya, whole way to uh, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, or uh, or in this area, possibly all the way to Zambia in the south. But you cannot live with your bus from here to Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, somewhere here. Mm -hmm. uh, or you cannot even live with your bus from here, Nairobi, to uh, Addis Ababa. There is no transportation uh, available to go uh, from, uh, um, from, uh, uh, from one place to another going to Ethiopia. And that's possibly the reason why uh, Ethiopia is, is still not, uh, um, it's not active when it comes to uh, economy and it also is leads to the, the Ethiopia not being able to, to, to have a, uh, uh, being poor country. Uh, but, uh, but they have a good, uh, uh, you know, they're controlling the, the, the African, uh, the airports, they have, uh, yeah, but an airport is not going to save someone like like uh, someone who has, you need a passport, that's the first thing uh, which we're going to be talking about. In order to go through the process of uh, airport, you need a passport, whereas if you're going to go with a bus, uh, you don't really need a passport. You can use your, your ID or your, your both certification uh, to go from one country to another. But when you go through the part, the airport, you need a passport, you need all those kind of visa and nonsense. You, visa, you apply for the visa and you wait. Yes. On the countries, some countries, they tell you, okay, wait, after two weeks, you are going to get your visa. Some countries say three weeks, you will get to get your visa. And, and, I, thought and, Africa, I thought Africa was uh, visa free intercontinental now no. for African states. I that's think it's, that's it's what we are looking for now. Go ahead. No, it is now. And Nigeria was the last assigned. Maybe Rwanda. Sister Bumi can answer that. They started with Rwanda, actually. But not yet. There are moves, you know, to, to get Africa visa free. And I know that there are regional pockets, like, for instance, ECOWAS in West Africa. Mm -hmm. um, it's become visa free for us to go to places like Ghana uh, and for them to come to us. Ghana, Sierra Leone, um, Republic of Benin that you mentioned. In the southern area as well, there's the SODEC regions where they have, you know, free movement. But it's not all over Africa yet. We're still work, they're, they're still work, the AU is still working towards that. But I think countries like Rwanda, they have all, also already started implementing it. I was in Rwanda, uh, where, unless it's happened within the last one year. I was in Rwanda yeah. last year. You know, and ironically, it was my Canadian passport that got me into Rwanda, not my Nigerian passport. Okay, because I was in the African free, uh, free trade area meeting with the, with the people from the AU, 
and we had some members who came from Rwanda, actually, and they, 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 they start talking about the idea that they have, Rwanda have already started implementing it. And them, the members of the AU themselves, they travel with their IDs from the Rwanda. Yes, that's what I was saying. There are regional pockets where there's already this visa-free movement, this but it's not all over Africa yet. So Rwanda probably has that arrangement with Ethiopia, you know, where you went for the AU meeting. Is that where you went for the meeting? The, the meeting was in DC. Actually, the people come from Africa to attend them. Well, they came to DC. Yeah. Um, uh, it's not yet all over Africa. It's not so yet. Let me Africa. let me talk about that one. I was in uh, those areas around uh, July. Uh, so I went in Rwanda. I went in Tanzania. I went in Kenya. I went in Ethiopia, and I passed in Uganda. So I definitely can talk about that. Uh, there is no one single place where you can actually live uh, without visa in, in Africa. In, but in Ethiopia, you can apply on a live visa. Uh, Even Kenya. In, yeah, uh, in, uh, and, and in Rwanda as well. But uh, Rwandese, if they want to go to, you know, uh, Tanzanians, if they want to move from Tanzania to Rwanda, they have a small paper they go through. It's not a visa or it's not a passport, or, or, or say like Ugandians, even if they want to go to, or Kenyans, if they want to go to Rwanda, there is a paper they fill out. I don't know how they call it. It's something like that. You just, they let you go, but it's like 15 days, something like that. So it is still a really huge problem, actually. There is no free, uh, no visa-free uh, country in Africa yet. Uh, and uh, the other, uh, the, the problem actually I saw, which I'm going to talk about this because this is the reason why we Africans will not even improve at all. It is the mindset of our trade, our buying and selling. Mm -hmm. uh, I am going to talk to you about this specifically. I think we need education, like basic education to educate our people. Uh, let me give you an example. If you take one bottle of water, just one bottle, pure water, pure, pure life, same, same water, uh, made the same date. And then you take the, same, the water, you take uh, one, one water, you give to uh, Chinese, another water, you give it to uh, uh, Ghanaian, another one, you give it to white European, another one, you give to Indian, and another one, you give to Arab. Then you, you tell them to go to sell the same water at the same price at the same market in Africa. Believe me on this, all Africans are going to buy from everyone except the Nigerian one. Okay? Yes. Which is actually what is happening even when it comes to bringing things from outside. They believe that uh, our mindset has become, uh, I don't know if it's registered, I don't know if it's tuned to, to think like some products from China, even like the Chinese are the worst pro uh, producer of bad product in Africa. Uh, in Tanzania, if you buy shoes from, Tanz uh, from China, it's one week. Next, next week you come home, there is, the shoes has no, no bottom. So how do we gonna deal with this? This mentality of thinking that whoever has come from China, come from Arabs, come from India is better product, even though it's the worst ones. How do we gonna deal with this? That's a good point, Brother Amani. Uh, just to tell the uh, listeners about uh, some of the natural resources that Sudan itself produces, and specifically to South Sudan, uh, it produces chromium ore, copper, iron ore, mica, silver, tungsten, zinc. Uh, that's in connection to uh, the petroleum resources. And then from the agricultural side, uh, some of the main crops consist of subrum, sesame, uh, to produce a lot of peanuts and cotton, and also uh, they produce yeah, Arabic but... gum uh, that is used to produce rubber. So uh, it sounds like a lot of the resources are going out of the country, but getting very little back in as a part of what it needs to, to survive as a nation. So we want to get our brothers and sisters on the ground who are in those various industries and sections connected with uh, brothers and sisters in the Afro diaspora, the United States, mm -hmm. uh, South America, Brazil, where we may be to begin to get our trading uh, agreements in place amongst ourselves uh, for the African Industrial Revolution. So 
what is it that we can do to help foster that uh, from your organization, uh, Sister Apollo? I think, you know, as you mentioned, all this, uh, we produce all these products uh, in the country, but currently there is no active, uh, active pr production for it. We are not using it like, the government is not paying attention to it where they, where they have uh, to work on it to be as a source of income for the country. So it's not activating currently as a source of income to the country itself. They're only depending on the oils. And we don't have that actual report from uh, the local communities or the, the government that is telling us we are investing, we are getting investing in this and we are planning to do on this. So. That's the problem here. Uh, going to your point, you said how we can how we can use the resources to yeah how we can we, 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 what we're interested in doing is bridging the gap between brothers and sisters in the diaspora who have uh, who are skilled and trained uh, to do okay. various different types of jobs in industries uh, and how we want to be able to get to connect up with our brothers and sisters on the ground so that we can help move the ball forward in in South Sudan. Uh, <laughs> how we can help make the nation itself be more of a whole and complete nation uh, by sharing our ideas and, and exchange and education. Uh, so are there any institutions okay. uh, that are in place to help foster that uh, yes, from the grassroots level? Yeah, because I think it's when it comes to development and leadership uh, for, for youth, for women in general, it's better to work with uh, nonprofit organizations and people who are leaders who have passion for change than to be get involved in the government uh, because as we are talking about education and changing, changing the mindset that will require a lot of civic activism work and to educate that people uh, so that they can be aware of what they can do and what, what's supposed to be done to change the, the community and to change the, the society itself. Uh, the diaspora have a lot of qualified people and leaders. Uh, the people who uh, they have that uh, education uh, the technology and the financial models and different kind of experience that they have here, uh, we, that they can connect with the people who are under the ground to help them, to help deliver that experience to the global market because it's the 21st century and there is a lot of uh, industrial revolution that is taking place worldwide. Uh, economically, you know, uh, in terms of development, in terms of uh, polit political system. So these qualified leader in the diaspora have to work with, with the people who are under the ground uh, to bridge that gap. They can also help them to develop the, the research, research center or the vision that they, they, they can be working on for the upcoming 10 years, for example. And then the people under the ground will be working directly with the local community and report uh, for each other uh, what is going on. Uh, then we reach the point where we, we are working together to, to be in the global market with the people from diaspora and people who are in South Sudan in the country. Right. Then, uh, go ahead. Um, real quick, my brother. Um, so, you know, what's going on with Sudan is going on with every um african country every african nation well not every but most well we can say everyone for the most part is um and they go I, I i'm going back to an example in the 1920s when uh haile selassie was regent to the throne he he hadn't ascended to the throne yet but uh he he sent a lot of ethiopians out to be educated in around the world. Some even graduated from Howard University, particularly Dr. Malik Kubayan, who was his uh, personal physician and his cousin, who while he was here, realizing the need for development for Ethiopia, mm -hmm. began to organize um, the Black Americans, the Africans in America, um, you know, to, to, to go back to Ethiopia to start to develop and bring Ethiopia up to a level that was necessary at that time. And so, and that mission still continues today. Um, I don't know what you're doing, Sister Apollo, and this isn't towards you personally, but people from the South Sudan who are outside of South Sudan in the diaspora, you know, perhaps 
have to do the same thing. Uh, put those universal want ads out, so to speak, um, to the people who have the education, the, quali the qualifications and the skills necessary to develop um, a sustainable, productive South Sudan, to develop the industries, to develop um, the educational system for the ladies, for the women, um, water, to develop infrastructure. So Sudan, South Sudan is in need of civil engineers. It is in need of um, agriculturalists. It is in need of so many different people and backgrounds, okay? So that's it. I'm going to put the ad out to all the world tonight, to all the Blacks in the diaspora who wish to see a successful South Sudan. Please contact Sister Mary Apollo, right? <laughs> and start to sit down and develop and, 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 and bring your plans and your ideas and prepare to move to South Sudan. Yeah, what do you want with, uh, right. You understand where I'm going? You understand where I'm going? Yeah. All right. That's yeah, what's uh, needed for every country, you know, black country to develop, right? Yeah. We in the black diaspora have to go home, have to work, just like the Jews. How did they build up Israel, right? Even to this day, a plane landed in Israel with 400 Jews from around Europe, France, all over, who repatriated to Israel. And they're bringing back euros. They're bringing back dollars. They're bringing pounds. They're bringing all kinds of things along with the education to strengthen and develop Israel. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I have a hand raised. Uh, do you... Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about what you have said, but if you try, we can try to do this kind of uh, leadership training uh, between uh, different countries. For example, if we took people from the diaspora and people who are in Africa, in South Sudan, but you have to bring them with the idea of that they are coming to a leadership training where they will be working in the, 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 the idea of Pan-Africanism. Because right now there is a lot of leadership uh, program training that is designed for African, but they are working in different vision. They are not working in Pan-Africanism. And if we can do this kind of exchange program, that's also going to be helpful. We bring the person from there, we train them, and then the person will go under the ground we work on the project uh, that is supposed to design to serve our idea, our vision, our mission. And then from there, because we also have people who are qualified under the ground. There is a lot of people who are unemployed uh, because the employment sector itself is it, it, uh, it dominated by specific people. If you are close to the, to the people who are in power, if you have that, you can get a job, you can get an opportunity to bring what you have to the table. So they can also train the people who are there in the local communities who are under the ground there and help them do the work. And also we have people like who are engineers here, who are people who plants, who writes, uh, who, who are in, in different fields, in medical fields. And, and, and they, those also can go and, and help there on the ground to develop the policy, to do the infrastructure work under the ground. And then from there, this is how the country will, will develop. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I have a hand raised by uh, uh, Nut, Natu, yeah. Nat, uh, okay, go exactly. ahead. Good, good, good evening. Good evening. Hello, I am, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm just getting um, uh, the invitation from my brother, uh, Samuel, engineer Samuel. I just uh, want to give my idea, like, um, I hope you guys understand my English. I just, a lot of... Uh, uh, I lost my English here. I live in Germany. So because of uh, German, I lost a lot of uh, words. So I try to speak. I try to explain my idea. So as my sister said, or you guys said that, uh, how can uh, develop African? So, so I'm, uh, I just here in Germany, I got a lot of uh, like uh, uh, information or, uh, so I work in, uh, in the social, uh, social, uh, as a social care so we meet a lot of african and i meet a lot of african so last year i uh, i got 350 uh, from different africans guy and then i try to uh, show them uh, the system and to get uh, 
how they can survive their life in Germany and they, they get our speed long, which is like apprenticeship, like uh, like technical things, they are happy. So what, what I uh, saw uh, in here in Europe or in Germany, a lot of Africans, they uh, always uh, suffer. So they are the one, so cleaning the streets or, or working somewhere like the, 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 the last war, I mean, the, the worst war. So here, uh, a lot of Turkish and uh, uh, Syrian, they have a nice job. They, even if they, if they don't speak, uh, where, if, they, if they don't speak German, still they have nice places. So, so I, say, uh, I say for African uh, brothers, so why we are the, the last person in, in Europe? So, and then I collect them and just talk to them. Then I, 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 try, to find, I try to get uh, more uh, like uh, information. And then they say, they are the one, uh, we are the one is the, the last person from the world. I mean, uh, like uh, we get, we are not getting more information. So um, uh, what I'm, when I'm coming to my uh, idea, so I think it's, uh, it's important that, that all Africans, like if we work and use. Uh... Hello? Yeah, are you listening to me? Yeah, right now you're back. Oh, all right. So I think it's, 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 uh, it's important if we uh, like work on this uh, uh, youth group that if we, if they, they can change uh, uh, like tradition and uh, or, or uh, uh, something like, which is like, let me say, for example, uh, South Sudan or, or North Sudan, wh wherever from Cameroon, Congo, uh, uh, or Nigeria, if they come to Ethiopia or from Ethiopia to uh, Cameroon, if they change uh, the, the uh, uh, information or, or traditional or things, and then the, the Africa can also build up, you know. So these things I, I got from uh, uh, Chinese. So I, travel as uh, like uh, to uh, some uh, Europe countries like let me Italy and Portugal and there. I see everywhere uh, Chinese people I, I see everywhere like Europe people they are like a lot of uh, young people they go and then they, they they make a photo and stuff then they're back to the country and then they they produce some uh, some stuff and then sell it back to Europe or Africa. So we, ha we have to understand this system. So I think if we work on youth group and if we change, exchange that like uh, the, uh, the information idea that the, the young people, they go to somewhere to, to, to Canada and um, to, to Cameroon or, or to uh, any African country and from uh, from the other country to, to other country. So if we change that like this way, we can build our, our country, our African country. So I think this is my idea. So um, I hope you guys understand my English, so. <laughs> yes, yeah. thank you, Brother Netu. I think Brother Netu is just talking about uh, getting youth exchange programs in place that could help foster the Pan-African movement, uh, would also help foster uh, economic development between the nations as well. And I think that's what you're saying. Am I correct, uh, Brother Natu? Exactly, yes. Yeah, this is what we talked about earlier. And then I would like to also add a point of, uh, because we have that my, the mentality of that kind of mentality that everyone is working to get a job in the government. And there's a few people who, are able to get these kind of jobs and they, we have a lot of qualified people who are ending up unemployed. Uh, I think we need to bring and sell the idea also of entrepreneur and people can start working and come with the initiative for themselves. There is a challenge, there is also a lack of resources, a lack of information, but if we can help train them, uh, give them kind of trainings, it can be done virtually or under the ground, uh, and provide them with some uh, uh, reliable resources also that they can work with it. And then from here, we can create uh, another sector that, that will be uh, developed and that will be active in, in balancing in the, the country development itself. So we have the, the person, the people who are in the private sector and, and people who are also like the entrepreneur who are working by themselves. Okay, yeah, I saw the hands raised by Yibe. 
Uh, Yibe, microphone is yours. You are. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the, the opportunity. I mean, actually, it's the right time, uh, you know, to join you. And, and you know, uh, it's very honored to having you now. Uh, actually, you know, it's very interesting issues are uh, raised uh, so far. Uh, and uh, I'm invited with our li my little brother, Sam. Uh, from Addis, and uh, you know, it's a great honor to know. Last last week also, I was I joined you, and it's very interesting thing you are raising. Just I have ideas like to appreciation of the group, like as a Pan Africanist, and uh, really we what we need. And uh, I want to uh, share you actually uh, three things uh, in in short within maybe three or two five minutes. Uh, uh, first of all, like uh, uh, you know, uh, this. Uh, uh, African countries' unity is really uh, important at this critical time. As uh, uh, Africa is the richest continent from the world, e even if uh, uh, there was a resource uh, there, like all the diamond, the petroleum, and the natural resource, including the coffee, is found in in Africa, and all the cacao is from Ghana. You, you know all the the stories, but. Uh, uh, Africa is not the major player in the economy of the world, as uh, most of, as you mentioned before. And uh, when I'm saying this, uh, first uh, I introduce as a, as my, I introduce myself for other people as Pan-Africanists. Uh, maybe last year in July 23rd, in 2019, I organized one event uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, at the Embassy of Ethiopia as uh, connecting community together. Uh, that was that was like we, uh, we tried to connect uh, all African uh, with the uh, Caribbean with African American. So that really helps me to know uh, how uh, all other African people are living and uh, how we can collaborate together. So uh, here is the thing now. Uh, that July 24th, in fact, just you mentioned the moderator just mentioned that it's a uh, birthday of Haile Selassie, in fact, but also. We are already uh, submit a letter for Ghana Embassy to celebrate Kwame Nkrumah for 2020, July 23rd. John, Jomo Kenyatta, all the Nigerians, South African, all the Sudanese leaders, we are planning to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm in charge at this time here in the United States. Uh, one of the, my partner is in Addis now. So uh, the thing is now I'm, I'm trying to share you is uh, really what we need is unity in using uh, U.S. Like I'm feeling like U.S. and Africa should be collaborate together uh, to uh, use with the U.S. technology with the African African uh, resource. I'm like we can use like that. And uh, before uh, you know, Sam, we we have we are already started the project with Sami as the manager. He's he's a president and a founder of his technology company. But I'm working for him as a, a manager with my uh, collaborating, my, my own uh, impact establishing company called Afrisa Cyber Media. So I'm also in the media and uh, in, 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 you know, the, uh, the Sami have his own project on satellite. So I'm, I'm working on that too. In, in, in six months, he's, he's launching his rocket. So I'm, I'm part of that. And, and also at the same time, there is one big hope with the one uh, Ethiopian investor called Dr. Fusta, uh, he's working. I'm also as a manager there at GPMS or uh, Black Economy Unity. It's uh, already selected uh, to invest here in the United States in, in finance, in back Africa, in, in uh, pharmaceutical stuff, and for his five countries. With, from that five countries, Ethiopia was not relisted, to be honest. It was not listed, to be honest. First, we, the, the, Dr. Fusta was contacting uh, Paul Gagami of uh, 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 Rwanda in, in investment on that thing, like in the pharmaceutical stuff, because the guy is the first person in private university in Ethiopia, Dr. Fusab Tamari. You can check his biography. And uh, so uh, there is hope uh, in, in large for Africa and we as with US technology to grow uh, each other. And, uh, you know, we don't be like, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is there, there is my point actually like honestly like I feel I see hope and I see uh, unity I see gi giving credit for the leaders before including Ayla Salate, Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, the Nigerian leader, the Sudanese leader or all the 
uh, Middle uh, Africa, like uh, Central Africa or Southern Africa leaders, including Mandela. You know, Mandela was trained in, in Ethiopia in military tra training. We, 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 we can uh, mention that too. And in, in 1936, when Haile Selassie was in League of Nations, he was the only black person representing. Are you there? Can you hear us? Yes. He, he was the only person, black person at that time, and every other European country said, you are monkey. You, they said they bully him, and he still regrets to not to send uh, the, these students to uh, Western uh, uh, technologies and uh, advancement, but he, he made a mistake on that because okay. when, I teach, when, when, I teach, when I teach here, here in, uh, in DC Catholic University, there is a bunch of 400 books about astronomy in a Catholic University library, you can check. Like everyone can come and Africa is a pioneer in, in everything. Like we can mention every civilization. So, you know, we are collaborating. That is my point actually. Thank okay. You before. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, let me give microphone to uh, PhD uh, Boomni. There is no question has been asked, so um, he was making comments. So, uh, Dr. Okay. Boomni, I'm also not, um, I'm, I'm not asking uh, questions. I just want to lend my voice to some of the very profound things that I'm taking away from this meeting today. Um, Mary Apollo, I mean, you you give me a lot of faith in the continent as a young person already doing what you're doing. I recently started working with a group of young people um, and the idea is to get them to start thinking like you. You know, they are called Ubuntu revolutionaries and the idea is for them to see themselves as very instrumental to whatever society they find themselves. This is because as a Nigerian, I get very, very easily frustrated with the, with the level of poor leadership. And uh, I've kind of given up on my own generation. And so I'm concerning myself with working with the youth. Now, some of the other profound things that we, 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 we've touched on, but I, we also need to focus on a lot is that, yes, Africa, in terms of resources, is the richest continent on earth. But poverty pervades most of those uh, 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 most African countries. Um, Brother Raz gave a very simple and uh, so very sensible suggestion, you know, which in an ordinary situation would have been a good solution. This idea of saying, look, our brothers in, in the diaspora, African Americans and other educated Africans have the uh, well, uh, the knowledge, the professionalism that we need to develop Africa. And in, in, in an ideal world, that would solve Africa's issues. But Africa's issues are beyond that. There are international or, uh, organizations that are set up to make sure that Africa fails. And we need to use every resource we have to continue to fight those organizations. Organizations that, are, that purport to save the world the World Bank, World Trade Organization, um, IBM, these, and then of course you have the major powers. You have China, you have Europe, and you have America. So we, these are uh, um, things that make it impossible for uh, Africa to actually use our resources apart from our, 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 our poor leadership. Now, I see that a number of things must be in place, and I think whatever platforms we have, we have to use them to, uh, to fight for those things. First, is this borderless Africa that uh, has been mentioned here. All of us who are Africans in, in our countries, we must put more effort into seeing that we have those intra we strengthen intra-African connections. Colonizers deliberately put them in place when they were living. In the, the French made sure it was cheaper to call from Republic of Benin to call Paris than to, uh, than to call Nigeria on the phone. For so many years, those things are just being broken down. We need to use all every power we have to fight for a borderless Africa. And then we must call for a, a, a move by everybody of, uh, who is of African descent to have access to be able to 
get African citizenship. So that when we're asking African Americans to come and invest in Africa, they must also have ownership. And that ownership will come from having the citizenship that will open them to whatever uh, resources, uh, financial, international financial resources, they would also need to be able to come back and, 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 and build the, the continent. So it's, it's a long haul, but we're all small, you know, but we all have agency and we just need to, to focus you know, on the things that we're taking away with every one of these meetings that we want to now emphasize. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, um, uh, 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 PhD Bumi. Bumni. No, my PhD is not my name. <laughs> okay. My okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. So I have That's to mention Dr. that. That's Dr. Bumni. That's Dr. Bumni. Okay. Hey, okay. Give it up to her. That's what's up. I, I don't know. I Thank never go Bumi. that high. So I, uh, <laughs> I finished my high school by chance, you know? All right, uh, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, this, uh, I think uh, I have, I saw Jerome uh, Matthias raise his hand, but I will come to him later on uh, because we're about to finish anyways. Now, my, my whole, the last question uh, to our special guest, uh, I was hoping that uh, the other lady from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, he came in, but he haven't. My really last question is this one here. Each country in Africa has its own interest, okay? As 55, uh, if it's not 57 now, they keep popping up, but each country has its own interest. And this free trade we're talking about is against some of countries' interests. For instance, uh, the, the going from uh, Kenya to, uh, to Tanzania, you need to have a visa. If you live from here, US, and you wanna go to uh, Kenya, you can have one visa to Kenya, uh, Rwanda, Uganda, I believe maybe Burundi too as well. But Tanzania was supposed to be in that group and they say no, because the interest is that people will come from everywhere and go to land in Kenya and then go to Kilimanjaro, Mount Kilimanjaro, and they will lose the money. So they made almost difficult, almost impossible for you if you wanna do the easy way, you have to buy visa specifically for Tanzania. Uh, so how do you think it's going to work? Because the country we have today was co uh, created by colonizers with intention of keeping us divided, but also intention of uh, keeping us not being able to, to trade among a country, among another countries in Africa. So how do we going to dismantle this? How do we going to uh, get a way? Because countries already, they, they are kind of entire to their borders and they, they, don't, they have the kind of privacy that they don't want anyone to, to come in and, and do any trade. How do we gonna dismantle this? I think this is also a challenge, but you know, like take for example, country like Kenya, Kenya has the largest economy in the East African community. Their trade is 1 billion. Their trade with China, uh, 1 billion each year. The U.S. 500 and its U.P. is only 69 million. Between, so as you mentioned, those countries, some some of them they have their own interests. But what what they need to think about is to take the general profit for the continent, because the development and the stability of the continent would also make the 55 countries be able to get their economic independence and. Uh, be, get their uh, their stability in the continent because when we talk about the uh, free trade confidence and trade area that is a new opportunity to, to open the door for globalization and development and we serve the interests of our people in the continent and to open uh, a chance uh, of the informal sector a job for, for, for people across the border a lot of people will be crossing the border, as we mentioned, so that it will be a chance for a cultural and a social integration, either for women or in the population of the continent. And this is what we have been kept out of for a long of time. So like this kind of fear can disappear, the person who are scared to go and trade in another country. So if we interact socially and culturally between each other, 
we can understand uh, how, how we think, how we can solve this problem. Also in terms of jobs and finance, uh, there should be, there will be a lot of entrepreneur and, uh, and jobs for women, the people in the continent. We should also have kind of some of affirmative uh, finance actions, uh, plans that will help those people develop their businesses and being sustain, sustained and integrated in the financial market of, across the continent. And you, so we can use the skills, we have the infrastructure that we have in the continent. Uh, politically, we will be able to create that kind of uh, leadership that we are looking for and be part of decision making. Uh, also, that can uh, sustain the, the continent in itself. And in, and in the business sector, we can work with the small organization, with the businesses to develop them. In the technology, uh, we have to create the digital entrepreneur. This is what the world is dealing with right now instead of we having the traditional entrepreneur and this is also can be less cheaper and less cost uh, for us uh, we have to develop the data center uh, the good services system for for our citizens and this is will create instability and will end up the the war and the instability that we have in the continent uh, development in the industry that will help us to, uh, to build the in infrastructure and it will be a trade exchange between this country to another. Uh, we use the port, we use the the, the, the road to, to work with each other. So let me conclude by saying that also uh, deliberately technology will help the women and the people in the continent to lead themselves and to move from the poverty to the instability and this is what the Africa continental free trade area will be will be able to to solve this problem because we are not we are no longer going to be hostages for for what we have in our mind and our limited experience from the colonization and what we have in our minds so we need to change uh, this kind of uh, of thinking by movement by this, uh, this uh, interaction, by the integration between, uh, between us in, in the continent. And this is, this is what is going also to change of this kind of, uh, so we can also push the leaderships in this country to change our, uh, the way they think about uh, how this uh, agreement will work, the way, the way we want to vision ourselves trade with another country. The people themselves can, can change that vision. If, if we, we reach that level of we having we are aware of it, we can push the government to change this the way that we want to work with each other. Uh, so Matthias, Matthias uh, Jerome, uh, you have one minute. It's already getting late. Uh, Matthias, okay. you haven't talked. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, uh, I have you missed um, an area part. I was watching one of your videos on YouTube or the show came on. Okay. Can you get me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, we hear you. Barely. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Quick question. Um, do you do you think, um, think uh, South Sudan has the right uh, infra infrastructure place for like uh, like you know like IT um, and all time media you know in terms of if uh, people from the diaspora wants to move to uh, South Sudan or other African countries to um, to to uh, up and grow up. A specific talk to that if it has the right, like, uh, if it has, like, um, you know, of internet, stuff like that. Uh, the right infrastructure for people to move in. If it's muted. Yes, that's what he's asking. Uh, okay, yeah, actually, there is. Uh, it's, it's, it's just costable. It, it depends on the kind of services that you, you are willing to receive. Currently, uh, the government is start working in some of the basic services like the water, building the, the water system and the electricity in some of the areas that they, they were already have it. There is, lately, there is a problem of insecurity and this is most of the, the, the most important thing that, uh, that uh, Hand, hind people back from uh, moving there and continue doing their businesses. But I think it's a matter of time and it's a matter of uh, 
because also there is an instability in the in the in the political system currently in the country and and, and regionally that's why it's, it's in fact the insecurity but the issue of the insecurity will will solve soon so as soon as there is a good insecurity then the infrastructure is there and also the people who are going there with the mindset of building they can help in leveraging the infrastructure itself hopefully i, I answer your point yeah, okay all right thank you so much thank you for the, the insight uh, i think uh, if jerome if you're planning to move to Sudan, uh hold on let me mute this gentleman uh, if you plan to move to South Sudan, please uh, join her. She will give you some information how to go to live in South Sudan. Uh, now, uh, let's let's finish uh, today by uh, by concluding that uh, we Africans we have wrong way to go, uh, especially when it comes to the idea of unity, uh, working together. Uh, and also this uh, uh, continental free trade will definitely change a lot of things in Africa, but uh, it's still nightmare how this is gonna work. Because as you all know, uh, our African uh, countries and groups and tribes as well, they are very, very uh, defensive when it comes to uh, penetration and, and the collaboration to each other. Uh, special countries, countries, each one of them, it does not matter how small it is, uh, it may have its own interest in, in, uh, in, in one area. Some of, some of them are, has, are kind of closing doors to everyone because they possibly have natural resources or the land, uh, most of the time is the land, or also the money, uh, which we did not talk about, uh, some countries, the money is higher than another country's money. So, like, if you send one dollar, in Ethiopia, I believe it's around now uh, 31 or 32 bill. Or bill. Uh, if you send one dollar, in Tanzania, it's around 2,000 uh, 2, Tanzanian shillings, uh, whereas it's around almost 3,000 in Uganda shillings. Uh, and is is uh, is uh, possibly I don't know exactly how much it is, but it is very very low. Uh, in Kenya, you will possibly get maybe one dollar. You will maybe get like twenty, you know, uh, maybe twenty uh, Kenyan shillings. So you see, the money is different, and some countries do not want uh, people from next country to come in because the money may be low, or the natural resources they don't have natural resources or the land. Uh, they they are afraid of immigrants coming the country because they have big land and the next country may not don't have a land like special like in Rwanda, Rwanda don't have big land so when people are trying to go to Tanzania they're not gonna be allowed to go there, uh, and vice versa. So I don't know how this uh, continental free trade and movement of people from one country to another is gonna work. Let's just wait, uh, but we as young people we must take uh, our first uh, step and uh, we must take leading on this. We must, this is no option because uh, we are in a position to to now look at uh, those uh, private countries' interests, but to look in general how we can overcome as all Africans. Again, uh, I think uh, we're gonna end today. Uh, it's already been too late. Uh, before we end, uh, I would like to share with you our creed, uh, which uh, uh, our our people, uh, they already know what it is about. Uh, let me see. Yeah, uh, no, this one here. Yeah, so our creed is uh, is this one here. Oh, no, not this. Yeah, it was. Uh, just give, hang on for me. Is this one here? The audience comment. Huh? Did the audience comment? No, yeah, it's this one here. Okay, so you guys, you can see that. Yeah, this is our creed. I am an African, regardless of where I was born, where I live, my tribe, my religion. I'm an African. Uh, Africa, Africa is my identity. God bless Africa. I'm an African. So regardless of where you were born or where I was born, where I live, uh, my religion, my tribe, 
Africa is my identity, God bless Africa. Those, that is our creed. You need to keep that in your mind. Anywhere you are, anything you do, you are African first. I think, I think this is good, Johanny. Sorry, I, let me thank you again and, and for the host and new African network. I think what we need to do as youth, we need to continue doing this kind of education to change our people mindset and tell them what they're supposed to do. And we also, at the same time, we have a lot of issues that we can fight for, like issues of identity, citizenship, you know, uh, those kind of issues that have been the colonizers or our leader have been putting in us as young youth that are handling us back from moving forward and achieving the development that we want. So we will just continue working on that until we achieve what we want to do. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, we are doing, we have a petition that we are writing around uh, to send to Africa Union. If they don't meet our demands, we're going to have to make another decision. Yeah, there is a petition. It's going on. Uh, yeah, if you guys, you know my WhatsApp, you can check on me and I will tell you what is going on there. Again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for today. And the word of today in Swahili is Uhuru, which means freedom. Uhuru. You know Uhuru from Kenya, president of Kenya? Uhuru. So freedom. That's the word for no, today. Lieutenant Uhura. Eh? Star Trek. Come again, Matthias. I know Lieutenant Uhuru from Star Trek. Yeah. Ah, okay, yeah. So Uhuru means freedom. Again, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, thank you so Rasa much. Well, I don't know what I'm talking about. And, uh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for coming in. I wish you a wonderful weekend. I wish you next weekend. I believe we're going to have maybe uh, uh, Brother Eugene. We're going to have uh, Woodmeyer uh, and uh, Juliet. Yeah, we're going to have uh, Sister Juliet Ryan from the Gambia and also Brother Wudamaya from Ghana. Both of those people are going to be coming on and giving us some inspirational as well as some informative information about what's taking place in the Equus Nations, Ghana, and also Gambia. So we look forward to having them on next weekend. Yes, and also, by the way, those are YouTubers as well. So they know a lot of things, special Wudamaya when it comes to China. Yeah, he's an expert on that. Yeah, so we will see you guys next Saturday at 6 p.m. in Washington, D.C. time, which I believe is around 1 in East African time, in Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Somalia, uh, possibly in the Uganda, too. Mm -hmm, Be blessed. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Thank you, Sister Paula, for coming on our network, and uh, we hope to have you back on the show sometime again soon. Yeah, soon. Thank you, Brother Guinea. Maybe we share some culture next time. Thank we'll you see some culture, culture exchange. Uh, you know, Sudan is a very, it's the mecca of black culture. And uh -huh. so next time we have you on, we want to definitely speak about Sudan's culture, the region of Kemet, uh, where black people civilization was founded. So we'll, we'll talk about that next time. Yeah, that's interesting talking, sure. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.